the state government than in previous years. Uh, because the state government budget is still a sizable part of the river state economy, we can also expect an impact on overall economic activity. These changes in revenue mean that the winner of the elections, as the partnership elections in River State, will face tough choices. And we hope answers in this section of the debate will throw more light on what we can expect from the candidates once they are in office. So, to our first question, gentlemen, and the first person we will go to is Mr. Tony Prince of the Labour Party. Given the extended fall in oil prices, can you give us the key headlines on how your administration would manage the resulting drop in funds available to the River State Government? And what can you add to assure us that these steps are realistic and sufficient? Given the extended fall in oil prices, can you give us the key headlines on how your administration would manage the resulting drop in funds available to the state government and what can you add to ensure or to assure us that these steps are realistic and sufficient? Thank you. I think it's a very good question. It emphasizes the reason why it's important that in our choice of governor we have individuals who are creative, who understand the need to think on their feet. Now, I think the first thing I'll say is that it's a silver lining um, that is accompanying this black cloud. Um, we've been talking for a while now the need to diversify our economy. And um, we've been talking more than actually doing it. Now, for the first time, we're being forced to think on our feet because naturally, a reduced oil revenue means that uh, state governments who are reliant on huge oil budgets to fund their activities no longer have that luxury. But before we talk about the drop in oil revenue and what we do, it's important to know that just a bit of background will tell you that this is going to be a long process. Now, from shale oil uh, reduction, we've had about 2.5 billion barrels come into the market. And OPEC has refused to cut production. OPEC refused to cut production simply because Saudi Arabia refused to cut production. Now, if Saudi Arabia refuses to cut production, it's important that we realize that there's something going on behind the scenes. What is going on? A reduced oil price means that there will be pressure on countries like Iran, countries like Venezuela, countries like Russia. And the current political climate, if you don't understand the economic or financial or foreign relations, you will understand that there is a deliberate ploy by America and Saudi Arabia to ensure that they have a reduced oil price. That means that we should expect this for a long time to come because they want to put pressure on, on Iran, they want to put pressure on Russia. So we need a government that is prepared for the long haul. So diversifying the economy is, without doubt, the only way forward. Now what do you have to do? The first obvious thing to do that most people don't think about is that government has to be more efficient. I remember a governor saying to me once that a 23 billion naira project was a waste of money. In this day and age, a 23 billion naira project was a waste of money. How can we be saying that? Now, we have to be more efficient with our resources. So we need governments to be much more realistic, much more practical. So that's the first thing you have to do. Secondly, we need to diversify the economy into other areas. There are areas that people don't talk about. Everybody talks about agriculture. Of course, agriculture is key. And without a doubt, diversifying into agriculture is something that needs to be done. It's long overdue. But we also need to think about a couple of other things, which is that we need to expand our economic base. In other words, you need to have business community alive and well and kicking. And you can see that this forum was organized by the business community. Why? Because in this state, the businesses have had enough. The relationship between the business and the government has broken down because the government is not listening to the business community. So my responsibility is to make sure that I can expand the base by increasing what is important to the business community. And what is that? Multiple taxation, major issue for them. Government needs to deal with issues of multiple taxation. There is a bill right now in the House of Assembly that arrived in the House of Assembly in October 2012 to harmonize tax bills or tax, uh, taxes in the state. Up to now, it has not been passed. What are the other issues? Access to affordable capital. Government needs to make sure that access to affordable capital is possible for businesses. 
progressive, successive businesses that do well have to be given support by the government. Insecurity. We've talked about insecurity. Businesses cannot be thriving if insecurity is a major issue. So we need to increase our revenue base. And that is how you can increase your IGR and ultimately that is how you can move the economy forward. It's about understanding the language of business. If government does not understand the language of business, then nothing can do. We move on to our next uh, speaker to answer the same question. Mr. Nkuku Peterson, please. Thank you very much. Um, talking about the economy in an era of global reduction of oil price, I'd like to say that currently the government of Nigeria, same for the government of Uganda, is highly dependent on revenue from crude oil. That we must move away from. If we must grow our economy, budgets, like you said, depend mostly on federally allocated revenue. We will change that. But in addition to that, I want to look at two critical things. One, how are we going to fund our development programs? We have conceptualized a document or the Global State Development Financing Strategy. In that document, in addition to the federal allocated revenue, we should continue to build lighting for three key reasons. One is the shale uh, oil revolution, shale oil revolution in the United States, and the position of Saudi Arabia in terms of um, the quota, quota of production. In addition to that, we must reject our internal charity revenue if we are going to pursue any development program at all. If we reject our internal charity revenue, what are we going to do? Look at taxation. What are we going to do differently in taxation? Streamline taxes. My brother Tony made reference that to the fact that there is a deal before the state has passed in the tax harmonization deal. But unfortunately, I know that he doesn't understand how some of these things work. Now, the truth of the matter is that in harmonizing taxes, you require a lot of engagement with the third tier of government, local government. You are harmonizing between the state and the local government. Local government come with different and distinct laws. All of these laws need to be harmonized and synchronized with state laws so that you can come up with a piece of legislation that will last, will stand the test of time. In addition to boosting your internal charity revenue, the other thing you need to look at, there are several international development agencies out there, African Development Bank, World Bank, you have access to all these resources. If you do the right things, get your economic parameters right, in addition to that, we're going to explore what we call the partnership. There are a lot of things currently being done by government that we don't get that work in partnership with the private sector. Now there are other things the private sector itself can lead. The government can't do everything. Government should only be a facilitator. Apart from that, then the other thing is that we must change our spending pattern. We must reorder our priorities in terms of our spending pattern. You can't ignore the place of efficiency and effectiveness in government expenditure. And to, to arrive at that, the due process must be examined extensively. We are perhaps one of the few states that have a public procurement law in place. We are going to look at that law again, look at its implementation in May, and ensure that rivers will get value for every single cover of government money spent. That's one side. The other aspect of it, the other strand of it, is the diversification of the economy itself, which has become a mantra. Everybody talks about diversification of the economy. Nobody tells us how they intend to diversify the economy. If you ask people, everybody will tell you, oh, the solution to the dwindling oil price is diversification. Please, how do we intend to diversify the economy? We have said several different forums. We're going to focus on four sectorial areas. Area number one is agriculture, aquaculture, and agro allied industry. It's been said that for everybody talks about agriculture. The research has proven that agriculture has the highest capacity of absorbing people into employment and it absorbs across sectors. So those who are not skilled, semi-skilled and skilled can find a place in agriculture. It's the only sector that has that capacity. What are we going to do in agriculture? One, we have a model, the Songhai farm. We must Okay. Thank you very much. We now move to the next um, speaker. But please be reminded, gentlemen, that uh, after you've all answered the questions, you'll have two minutes each to give your comments on what your colleagues 
have said. Now, if there are things you feel you disagree with or you agree with, you'd like to prevent it from becoming governor. We go to Mr. Yesowike for his answer. Thank you. You just asked now that the very price oil at the states, if you are giving the mandate what they will do, no free will and that, that just really depends on oil. First thing we have to do as a government, then the river state is not a country, it's a state. We have to cut the cost of governance. Because when you look at the budget of those states, you find out that the cost of the current expenditure is so much higher than that of the capital expenditure. So government has a point of duty to make sure that it costs the cost of government. There are so many frivolities that if you look at the budget, it's not necessary. So government has to think what to say that certain things must be eliminated. Secondly, IGR is the key. How is IGR the key? You have to come back home and see how you can block the loopholes of entirely generated revenue. Like it's happening today, at the federal level, what the federal government is doing, now go back to now see which areas are we not doing well in terms of entirely generated revenue. That is key for us. And so for us, we're going to make sure that all the loopholes as it relates to entire general revenue will be stopped. I encourage people to pay their taxes. Now, when people talk about diversifying the economy, it looks as if government will go into business. Government should not go into business. Rather, what government should do is to create a enabling environment that will attract private investors, that will attract businessmen to come to the state. When they come to the state and establish, that of course will raise the revenue of a uh, government. So if I give you my mandate, what we will do is to cut cost of government too. We have to make sure that all the loopholes, all that that affect collection of entire revenue would be blocked in order for government to have more money. Three, government will encourage the participation of private investors so as to generate more revenue from those uh, businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Please be reminded the audience will not to make any responses, but to basically keep silent. Thank you. Gentlemen, you have two minutes to respond to what your colleagues have said. If there are things you agree with, you would like to remember or there are things you disagree with, but please be reminded that we have to strictly stay with issues and not personal attacks. So we come back to you, Mr. Tony Prinsel, for your two minutes, and we listen to what your colleagues have said and other things you want to comment on. Yes, of course. Um, first of all, I just want to respond to what uh, Dr. Pusset said, that uh, I doesn't know how these things work. <laughs> I'm sure he knows how it works. Um, I want to say, I think I'm very proud that I've not uh, played any particular, what you might call, hands-on role in government. If I've played a role in government before now, I think I'd be ashamed and embarrassed to tell my children that I play such a role. Simply because where we are as a country today is as a result of government. And I think I'm comfortable in saying that uh, We've not done ourselves any justice, not the uh, kind of uh, government or state that we want to pass on to our children. So uh, I'm proud that I don't have things wrong. But um, if you can explain to us how the bill is passed to the House of Assembly in 2012, October, uh, to harmonize taxes and create a business friendly environment so that uh, business costs can be predicted. And up to now, that bill is still sitting as well as saying, please, I'd like to know how government goes. Uh, Lagos State has done something similar. We've had tax organization in River State, in Lagos State, and it's a basic thing. What needs to be done is not rocket science. Um, i sure there's a reason. Um, I suspect you tell us. Uh, but whatever the reason is, the fact remains that River State is bedeviled by multiple taxation. It is bedeviled by all sorts of things. Right now, World Bank report says 32 out of 36. That's River State's position in the ease of doing business, or in the ease of starting business in River State. Now, I think that's a scandal, to say the least, that we are number 32 out of number 36 on the World Bank certified report, November 2014. So, I'm not sure how business works. My brother, um, Yesu Mike, has uh, said quite a few things. Um, I'm not going to address the state. Thank you. We go to your own role. We go to 
me say until we get these. You have two minutes to make your comments. <laughs> please wait some silence in the hall, please. Please, please, thank you very much. For the sake of um, being equal to everyone, let's try and make them grow. Your comments on both your colleagues. Yes, uh, the, my colleagues, they have talked about diversification of the economy. And I have said here that but by, by that, what they are suggesting is that government should own a business, government should own our own business and say no, that what should we should do is how we are going to encourage the participation of private investors, that when businessmen come to this group to invest, that of course will improve revenue generation, that of course will improve the funds of state government to be able to uh, solve the problems that they have because of the drop in oil uh, Right, so for me, I've said that what government should do is to encourage private participation, make the environment to be conducive, and not a situation where you want government to start running agriculture. No, but I would encourage private people to go into commercialize agriculture and from there make their revenue. So, and then you talk about multiple taxation. Multiple taxation has to come to where it affects private business men. In this case, of course, we all know that when you have much totalization, much totalization hampers, much totalization affects uh, industrialization. And so, I agree to that if we want to talk about industrialization, we must have to eliminate multiple uh, taxation. Thank you very much. We go to Mr. Kofi-san, any comments? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I understand Oh yes, concern. Maybe I'll respond to the concern first. Now, the way it works, local governments, by law, have powers to impose certain taxes and rates. If they are going to donate that power, or if they are going to give away part of that power, then you must engage with them. They already have local government laws, or by laws rather, passed by the various state arms of, the, of local governments. Now they are going to give away part of that law, uh, part of that responsibility to the state, or they share that responsibility. With the state in terms of collection of revenue and sharing of revenue. Now, you must engage with them for you to pass a law, and that engagement process cannot be done overnight. It's a process. And so, my brother may not have had this little experience, so may not understand exactly what we're talking about. Now, my other brother, um, uh, Chief Yes, when he talked about uh, cutting cost of governance, I don't see the relationship between cost, cutting cost of governance and engendering economic growth. It will help. I've said, but we must change these priorities. But it will not engender economic growth. The third one is the issue of diversification of the, uh, uh, the economy. My brother yes, we may not understand models, he didn't have opportunity of getting the kind of this thing we got. And so when we talk about diversification of the economy, we don't mean that government will go and run business. It could be a model. There are several models. And the final thing is the issue of policy. We also need to understand the difference between policy and political actions of government. There is a distinction between policy and implementable actions of government. There, is a, there seems to be a confusion in this room between policy and implementable actions of government. The final thing I have to say, in terms of that of the economy, we are saying that we are going to create a framework for participation in agricultural agriculture and agro-allied industries. The other one is the creative economy. Then at the deep the participation of people in oil and gas, and the final thing is hospitality. And tourism industry, but all of that will rest on a robust SLC platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Please, uh, we, we will beg the members of the audience to please remain silent. Uh, we don't want you to clap or chair, and we also don't want you to laugh or, or cry. Please, please, thank you very much. And also, please keep your phones on silence. We also will be with uh, candidates here to refrain from personal attacks and uh, let, let's stick to the issues um, uh, and the questions on the table. Thank you very much. We're moving on to the second question. And we're rotating this uh, um, segment of the comments, so you always have time to have a day in the sun as it were. Small business conditions in River State, gentlemen. Uh, as you know, in most not all economies, the role of government is not as a major employer. Um, rather, it is setting the conditions and rules for the local economy. In River State, there seems to be a consensus that multiple taxation is a problem 
for both individuals and businesses of all sizes, but there is not always an agreement on what specific steps to take to address this problem. Gentlemen, small businesses also face a range of problems from access to electricity through to challenges in bureaucracy that often seem insensitive to their role in creating economic growth and employment in River State. Also, accessing capital is usually a huge problem because of funds for small and medium businesses being available in theory, but when you look at the practical aspect of it, these may depend on knowing the right person who can pull the strings for you. Gentlemen, can you please describe the most critical steps you will take if elected governor of River State to improve the conditions for small and medium businesses in the state. And Mr. Abukutin said, you'll go first. Thank you very much. You asked some questions. First, let me agree with you that the SMEs should be the engine of growth for any economy, in fact, it not be uh, different. And what are the most critical steps I will take to engender growth among SMEs? Four critical steps. We'll address the first one, that is multiple taxation. And I said, we're already finding a solution to it by virtue of the law before the state has passed in the harmonization of that deal before the state has passed in Now, the second one is access to finance. Uh, we're also taking two critical steps. The first one is that the creation of River State Microfinance Agency, RIMA. The second one is the Garden City Equity Fund. Now, all of this is to ensure that small businesses have access to funding via one digit um, interest rate. The third critical thing is institutional support. We are trying to create an institution that gives training support to small businesses, access to markets, and most importantly, this institution will help all small businesses. The other thing we need to do is, or what we plan to do, is the River State Investment Promotion Agency, a one-stop shop. Another thing I said we intend to do is to create incubation centers in strategic locations in the state. In these incubation centers, you're going to have everything you need to grow businesses in one place. Mind you, one of the things we said is that we're going to drive our growth based on creative economy, aside from agriculture, oil and gas, and hospitality and tourism. So these are some of the elementary steps we're going to take. One, like I said earlier, harmonize taxes, access to finance, deal with that through RIMA and that is the equity fund where government becomes an interested partner in what you're doing, holds you through the process. The other one is to give institutional support through the University Investment Promotion Agency. Now we're looking at a cluster of power funds. It is on record that the University is the only state in the country that is self-sufficient in power, that it has not translated to power in homes and industries. Simple. The reason is that as we speak right now, the power generation is in private hands. Power transmission is in federal government hands, encumbered by several laws. Power distribution is in private hands. So government does not have absolute control. Then what we intend to do is to create small power farms in different locations where you have access to gas, provide incentives for private sector people to invest. Now, if we incentivize power, we hope that to attract investments in power, and this will rub off on small businesses because it's one of the greatest challenges they face. Thank you very much. The next uh, answer will come from Mr. Start with the issue of multiple transaction as a child affects uh, small uh, business owners. It's very obvious, and um, most people have enumerated this, that multiple transaction is a serious impediment uh, to making economic activities to, to uh, grow. Uh, as a government, it's not just asset and harmonization of our uh, tax laws, you must have the political will to implement that. If you don't have the political will, there have been a lot of laws that have been passed. How many people have implemented those laws? So it is important that you must have the political will. And I can assure you that if I have the mandate of the state, I have that political will to make sure that laws that have been passed as it affects multiple taxation will be implemented to the fullest. Secondly, you have talked about 
access to funds. It's very obvious that yes, so government government may have set up micro microfinancing and so some of these are political. If it is not political, why is it that we have microfinancing in this district yet we are still suffering from these problems? Some of it are political. Just to make sure that look, we have set up this microfinance agency to, to help our small business owners to grow. What is the impact of that? And so we must be sure to make sure that we don't just stop politics. Let people say that yes, this is what we want to do. If you give us the mandate, and I can assure you that we have to create access to finance. And that access to finance is that as the chief executive of the state, we must make sure that the, the essence why it is created or established is actualized. It's from time to time to monitor how many people have accessed these funds, how many people have been able to pay back. So not sitting in my office, yes, we have created funds, and let's be there, without identifying or monitoring whether people are actually accessing the funds. There could be some inhibitions and bureaucratic help, but today it has happened. One of the finance agency in River State, if you go to the ask them, what has happened? They will tell you a lot of political uh, interference. So for us, it's not just creating funds. No, we we'll create funds to be available, but we will not interfere. We will allow the agency to run it so that it will improve on what we are doing economically. Thirdly, of course, you have talked about the issue of power. It's very obvious that we pray by the grace of God, just like my colleague has said about transmission being a problem. We know what the federal government is doing today. That by the time that the power is fully privatized, it will obvious be able to do economic uh, activities. And we believe that it is of God in the next one year that distribution, transmission generation would have been fully privatized in this uh, uh, country. And that, of course, boom economic uh, activities. For us, too, we also go to what we call industrial parks. We wish to have an industrial park in the state. Where is it today? What is that happening? It is there. So, if you give us the mandate, we are going to bring back the establishment of this industrial uh, park that will promote small and medium enterprises in this uh, state. Creating an agency, like I've said before, to run these funds is not a problem. We must isolate the interference of one of these uh, agencies. I don't want to go personal, I don't want to say what the government has done, but the point still remains that part of the problem why people do not access this fund is because there is political interference. People who are given the mandate to run these agencies that enable these small business to have access to the funds are not given the opportunity, are not given the free hand to run these uh, agencies. So we can establish agencies of government in order to do this. At the end of the day, it will not function because there's always a political uh, interference. What we are trying to say that for us as a government, given the mandate, we are going to give autonomy to that agency so that people will be able to assess funds that government has established. Thank you very much. We go to the next speaker, Mr. Tony Bresler. Promises without capacity leads to calamity. Promises without capacity is to calamity. Our small businesses today, I think it's uh, absolutely clear that a couple of issues that are facing them. We've talked about multiple taxation. There's also an issue of access to affordable capital. There's an issue of security. There's an issue of power. And there's another issue which I think somebody may have mentioned, which is access to markets. They are the issues that are affecting small businesses today. Now, as for multiple taxation, quite clearly it's a problem. This government has not been able to fix it. Um, my colleague talks about uh, negotiation with local governments and so on. Negotiation to local governments started in 2008, to be precise. There were intergovernmental conferences between local governments and the state governments. A lot of progress was made, leading to the bill, which has been in the House, I repeat, since 2012. And now in 2015. So we have no excuse. Lagos State has done something similar. 
What do you do with an organization of a tax bill? You list all the bills, all the taxes that are collectible by the state and local governments centrally. That's what you do. You put a ban on all checkpoints so that nobody can collect tax on the streets. You identify those people who can collect taxes. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's not rocket science. The government does not pass a bill on tax harmonization. It means that government is not serious about addressing the issue of multiple taxation. So, that's for multiple taxation. That's what small businesses need. Access to affordable capital, of course, you need to give businesses support. My brother talks about an equity fund. That's fantastic. But there's some businesses that need access to capital at zero percent. It's not always about profit. As a government, sometimes you make an expenditure, you make a grant. We have all seen the bailout in America. Money was given to companies because you want to keep jobs. I said that my government's primary priority, we have a one-point agenda. That one-point agenda is job creation. We're here to create jobs. Now, the primary source of job creation is not government. So when we say we're here to create jobs, it doesn't mean we're going to suddenly appoint people. No. We have to create the environment for business to thrive. The only way you can create jobs is these small to medium scale enterprises can survive. This is a serious issue. And we have been playing with it. We have a River State Microfinance Agency, which is comatose. What activity? If it is working, then small to medium scale enterprises, or at least micro enterprises, will have been thriving and booming. That's not the story, that's not the case. So, we need to do something about these issues. We've talked about security. Lagos State has a security trust fund. That trust fund is a partnership between government and the private sector. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. The private sector in this state is not happy with the government. The relationship is not as it should be. So even if you set up a security trust fund under this current system, you will not find private sector contributing to it in any large measure because they have lost confidence in government. We need to restore the confidence in government. We need to start to talk to business. We need to make the environment friendly for business. Now, I've said it many times and I'll repeat it again, that you cannot give what you do not have. If you don't understand the language of business, then you can't talk to them. Thank you. Gentlemen, we move to the third segment. Still, third question is still on the economy. And this time we're looking at the issue of employment or unemployment as the case may be. In the past, the state government has been directly involved in youth employment and training schemes. There are numerous. We've lost count of them. But these range from local initiative to state versions of programs such as Shelby. Uh, the sustainability of mass employment programs has sometimes been questioned because it is not always clear how schemes will lead to long-term employment or longer-term employment. The National Directorate of Employment and other bodies have also identified unemployment as a major cause of insecurity with explosive and destabilizing potential for the polity. In the larger delta, the question of unemployment is especially complicated because of the pending end of the amnesty program, uh, where all the indications suggest a relatively high number of beneficiaries remain till date and very sadly unemployed. Finally, the economic circumstances facing the state government raise an important question whether there will be sufficient funds for major employment schemes, the likes of which you've seen in the past. If your administration is elected, will there be any major state-funded youth employment schemes? If yes, how can you assure us and the thousands and millions of people listening around the world that this scheme will be affordable and will lead to sustainable jobs. If no, where will you be putting your efforts to stimulate youth employment? We'll take the first answer from Mr. Vicky. 
Thank you very much. <coughs> of course, the issue of employment is a serious uh, problem in this state. And if we're given the mandate, what are we going to do in order to address the issue of employment? Uh, it is important for us to say this. At the federal level, we are all aware about Shopee. I do know that Shopee funds the direct to federal government, states, and local government. At the federal government level, you must have had a life you win program. What is this you win program all about? The win program is how young entrepreneurs are being mentored and see how they can improve in whatever trades they have taken upon. Um, that is the sense of part of the short period investment program. At the federal level, it works. You see a lot of youths that are from that, thanks to the fact that, yes, I'm used to have terrible tax situation in the rest. I'm able to mentor me the entrepreneurship today with the form that they given to me. I can now employ seven people. Now, whether you like it or not, that has led to employment of not less than 34 persons, which before this period was not possible. But at the state level, that is not the case. Obviously, shopping funds is used for political reasons. What, what happens, you find out that every month, you hear that people should go and collect money, uh, 20,000, 25,000, 50,000 uh, 50, to keep political loyalty which of course will not, will not last uh, long. And the government is winding up, obviously, you don't know the fate of that. Now, for us as a government, what is important that will create employment for us, we still have to come back to the issue of industrialization. If we encourage industrialization, obviously, we are going far to reduce the level of unemployment in the state. The, the state government has to, as a matter of duty, as a, as a part of responsibility, that it encourages industrialization in this state. And to be able to encourage industrialization that will lead to employment, it means that we have to eliminate multiple taxation. Secondly, it has to create a conducive environment that will enable people who are interested in setting up industries in the state. Whether we like it or not, also manufacturing is important. Government will, as a matter of fact, if you had Mr. President uh, talk about it uh, yesterday. Before now, agriculture is used to about the level of poverty. Today, as we speak, if we have the mandate to preside over the affairs of the state, we are going to use that as creation of wealth. So for example, in the, what we tend to do is to encourage private investors to come into commercial agriculture. Commercial agriculture that will create employment for our people. If we want to say, take an example as an example, I do know that in Abuja local government, you have varieties of uh, of uh, apple. And so if you want to say commercial agriculture and kinds of apple, not only producing, you can also, there will be a value chain of maybe uh, uh, producing the juice. So it's not only producing my uh, uh, apple, but it will in turn, as a company, produce the juice. And if this is done, it will. Still taking answers for question number three, we move to the next speaker. And this time we'll take the answer from Mr. Tori Frenchman. Well, I'm not sure if my brother understood the question or if I'm the one who missed the question. <laughs> because the question you asked is whether we have any youth employment schemes that are going to be funded by government. And um, for me, the quick answer to that question is yes. Um, for me, one of the biggest problems we have now as a state is unemployment. Um, I did not just call me and say I want to run for government today. Once I ran in 2007, I had a manifesto in 2007. I refused to call it a manifesto in 2015 because I've noticed that in reverse politics, manifestos don't manifest. So I've opted not to manifest this time. And this time we've come to a roadmap for the renewal of River State. 
that talk about prosperity, that's really you know, foundations are faulty. So what we're talking about here is, is there going to be a youth employment scheme? The answer is yes. Now, what are we talking about? A lot of our people are out of work. Clearly, going around the state in 2012, community to community, ask the people, what do you like about this government? What are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? If you were in government, what would you do? We took a survey of the whole state. We went around community to community. Sometimes we select the communities for two days, asking them what the issues are. So if you look at our roadmap, which is on circulation and the stands, you will see that it actually addresses the issues that people want. So on the issue of youth employment, we need to get our people back to work. Many of our young men and women are sitting at home with no job, no future. What we will be doing is we will be putting them back into the work environment, in what you might call internship schemes. We've started talking to business already, and what business is saying to us is that we're happy to take some of these young men and women into our companies. Let's share the cost. If this person was supposed to be earning 60,000 Naira as a graduate or as a first-time worker, we will pay the person less, but let's share those costs. So that that person now starts to understand what it means to wake up every morning and go to work. Now, businesses are ready to participate in this. All they're looking for is a government that understands their language and speaks their language. And the Labour Party government, which of course, I've said many times before, will include people from other parties, will ensure that this happens. So the answer, very quick answer to your question, is that there will be youth employment schemes that are funded by government that will be working in partnership with the private sector. I also want to add to that that many people, look at me, my background is petroleum engineering. But I didn't make my money from petroleum engineering. I made my money from information technology. And I studied petroleum engineering for five years in Uniport and did a master's for one year in Imperial College. Yet I made my money from information technology, which involved just one year training course. There are many people who have studied one thing, but given the right kind of support, they can change careers. They can become more employable. Now, it takes somebody who has had the experience. You cannot give what you do not have. Give me 50, 100, 1,000, 2,000 of your young men and women today and I'll create a future for them. What we need is to start to listen to our people. We need to talk to our people. The rate of unemployment is too high. Not every solution will fit everybody. It's not one size fits all. What we need is a government that listens, a government that understands, and a government that has the capacity to make a difference. I've said it many times and I'll repeat it again. Our promises without capacity will lead to calamity. What we need is a government that understands that the number one issue in this state is unemployment. Nothing else. Thank you. We move to the next speaker, Mr. Dekuku Peterson, for his answer. Thank you very much. Now, you ask a simple question. Do you have any youth uh, employment initiative or initiative to address youth employment? And somebody will without some statistics. But I'd like to put that up with the wrong information. The federal government unemployment rate in 2008, 2007, 2008 over around 25-27% and the statistics from the National Bureau of Statistics. Today, it's between 51 and 58% source National Bureau of Statistics. The implication is that the federal government has done badly in the area of creating employment for our young people. Now, River State statistics of unemployment is far below national average. The implication is that the state has done well in creating employment for our young people. We need to improve on what we have and take up new measures. Beyond that, there is the fact that we must address security challenge if we want to create employment for our people. There is a good relationship between insecurity and lack of investment in the state. And so that's key. If we want to create employment for our young people, we must address the issue of insecurity. Nobody can invest in an environment that is not safe and secure. The other thing we need to do, which is more important than having a single initiative, is that we need to put in place a policy, institutional and regulatory framework that will drive employment, employment the creation initiative. If we don't have a policy in place, if we don't have institutions in place, if we don't have a regulatory framework in place, it's like pouring water at the back of a dog. Every other initiative will fail if we don't have these things in place. And to that extent, our sectoral focus to create employment for our young people will be in the area of agriculture, as we have said before. 
then give their participation in oil and gas through uh, certification, international certification, give them skill. If you give them skill, they are likely to find jobs in the oil and gas industry. We have it with us here, we can't run from oil and gas industry. The second thing is, we are going to work with private sector people to create cluster of industries around the name of the capital and other of our natural assets. Then the issue of the creative economy, sports, fashion, information communication and technology, entertainment. The final thing is tourism. And all of that will create small and medium scale industries from these four sectoral areas. Aside from that, the other thing we need to deal with in the issue of youth unemployment at the very serious level is the issue of skills. It's good to talk about youth unemployment, youth employment. If they don't have skills, they will not be employed. We need to give our young people skills. And that again is related to our system of education. We can continue with formal and professional education and expect that young people will have requisite skills to work in the industry. And so we're going to pay attention to vocational, entrepreneurial, and technical education, apart from the conventional education, and be more interested in outcomes. Those are some of the little measures we intend to take to create employment that is sustainable. Now, so we talked about shopping. Shopping is not I oversight shopping in the National Assembly as at least as today. Shopping is not intended to create employment for people. It's an interventionist fund in other areas. And so shopping has created absolutely no employment, save for the fact that a place of persons with minimal labor jobs. Thank you very much. I invite the audience to participate by putting hands together for the gentleman. We would like to one of the things we are not to talk. Um, we are to keep silent, please. We know you have um, your people out there.